I thought what I would try to do with the, the limited amount of time is give you three big takeaways that I think as if you could deduce, like I'd give you three, you know, like people ask, like one, tell me one thing. Well, I'll tell you three things, I'll try, and hopefully these will be of value for some of you folks um, as it relates to your, your personal brands, your personal creative journeys, uh, et cetera. So you guys ready? Yeah. Show me you're really ready, it's Friday. Yeah. You're lying. <laughs> this guy is lying, no, he's ready. All right, so number one uh, prescription from a pharmacy dropout, uh, embrace the mess. Embrace the mess, okay. So Thomas Edison, right, 99U, right? You know what the 99 comes from, right? The fame, one of the great American entrepreneurs. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, right? Um, great entrepreneur. Who of you guys thinks, by a show of raise of hands, who, who here fancies themselves an entrepreneur? Show of hands. Who are the entrepreneurs? Who are the next Thomas Edisons? Keep your hands up. <laughs> Keep your hands up. OK. 99 percenters, the perspirers, you, you entrepreneurs. Uh, and the rest were the one percenters, I suppose. <laughs> right? Entrepreneur, you know, as a word, I kind of, um, I think the word entrepreneur sucks, frankly. Um, I, don't, I don't like the, the, the way that it's been kind of commandeered in a kind of a post-financial crisis as like the, the, uh, the, uh, um, as, uh, like the new rock star. It's like the new black. It's very fashionable, um, and it's been kind of thrown around quite a bit. Um, you know, ever since you know, uh, your crayons were dropped in second grade, it seems that if I would ask the same question of you, maybe per not, perhaps not this audience, being such a creative audience, uh, how many of you would have fancied yourself artists? If I asked that to you in second grade, you, you probably would all raise your hands, right? But it's interesting that when I asked that question of entrepreneur or artists, disproportionately today people raise their hand on the entrepreneur thing, and they don't on artists, which really kind of boggles my, my mind. You know, I kind of have a beef with this whole Thomas Edison quote thing, uh, to be honest with you. Um, it kind of implies that genius is related uh, to one's ability to manage the pain of the grind, right? 99% perspiration, right? Embrace the rigor, right? This all sounds like the, the, this is what entrepreneurs do, right? Hard work is the, the heart of genius, right? This is kind of the subtext for me. Also, I think, you know, when you're Thomas Edison, you have to motivate a lot of labor to get things done. It's very helpful to say, hey, look, remember, 99% is perspiration. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, not to be cynical. Uh, inspiration, on the other hand, uh, needs to be dosed carefully. Ooh, 1%. Careful. No, 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 1%, right? It is romantic and perhaps distracting, right? imagination. Um, in, after all, it could be a bit of a rabbit hole. This notion of ideation, I mean, how many times you get two people in a room, you get 20 opinions when they're trying to imagine and ideate on things, right? So this is where I kind of have a, a problem with that quote. And, and I think when you grind on the 99%, you kind of lose sight of perhaps the inspiration that's all around you. You're so busy perspiring. Just perspiring, 99 in it, all the way. <laughs> Even if you think you're an artist, like you're really just working on the perspiration piece, right? Losing sight of, in fact, the inspiration and dosing it in a way that may not get the best yield, right? I think that's because of the mess that's implied, right? That we've forgotten to somehow imagine, right? Somehow we think this notion of artist or creator, culturally, uh, is an indulgent notion. It's what self-indulgent, self-philosophical people that kind of get to dress in all black and lean back and, you know, like get to be moody and self-loathing, right? This is that we're sloppy, right? Um, that we don't necessarily have the, you know, we're right brain. You know, right brain, artists, right brain. Uh, don't give them the spreadsheet. Um, 
or it's just not for you, right? Because as you get older, maybe you lose perhaps some of that swagger or that freedom that when you were in second grade where you just would raise your hand, you know, and say, yes, I am in fact an artist. We also think that this notion of creator and artist is divine, right? There's some divine thing, like this, you know, the famous Michelangelo image. And then we struggle uh, in commercializing it. So we think that there's a holy war be between creative and art and commerce. And this inhibits our ability in our relationship with our art, right? So I challenge folks who perhaps don't necessarily fancy themselves artists, that just because you can't manipulate paint or sculpture or music doesn't mean that you shouldn't problem solve like an artist. That you have to learn to embrace the, embrace the messiness of creation. Embrace the mess. You know, problem solve like an artist. Give yourself more than 1%. Chill on the dosing, okay? <laughs> Number two, create wealth that matters. Create wealth that matters. It's always like, like the guy who's like, oh, you know, money doesn't matter. It's like the, you know, the guy comes in and he's got money and says that. And it's always like so saccharine and nauseating. I don't, I don't mean for it to be. I just want you to follow me on this for a second. We all went through, I presume, your K through 12 sentence, right? You guys did the K through 12, 13 year sentence. Uh, and where they teach us that math, uh, you know, that numbers don't lie, right? X plus Y equals Z. Well, I say, you know, they might not lie, but they don't always really tell the truth. Our emotions about them frame uh, uh, what, how they really work and what they really mean. And kind of culturally today, if you're in the design industry um, or media or broadcasting or even just using the efficiencies of social media and self-broadcasting, self-publishing, we culturally live at a time where we are just obsessed with counting. Our money, our grades, our wins, losses, followers, KPIs, page views, count and count and count. Count, count, count. <laughs> Quick counting. All right, quick counting. Oh yeah, big data matters. How can we, what kind of jerk is like big, the, like the biggest companies, uh, the ones that are getting the most funding, are, it's like all about data, right? It's about what we're doing. No, being human matters, okay? And you know, in a pursuit of quantitative gymnastics, you can't lose sight of qualitative intent. All right? You can't lose sight of the human factor, the being human matters, the why, the how. You, you dig what I'm saying? Right? The shit that really matters that you should be really counting. Okay? <laughs> That's what matters. That's what we should be counting. Qualitative excellence cannot be hacked. I don't care how much funding you got. I don't care what brand you're serving, what, what, who from the valley, what media company, no. Qualitative excellence cannot be hacked. Nature will not allow it. I don't care how deep and dark part <laughs> of the web you look at, you're mining, harvesting, all you could predict it before it happens. Right? Being brats. Trying to seek validation that can only be found in the finite as if something could really, as if, if humanity could be so definitively organized like a number. Wealth that matters cannot be counted. You follow? All right. Number three. Be an unlabel. Be an unlabel. This is going to be harder for you to predict. This is kind of perhaps the... 50,000 feet up view of what the spirit of my book is, is about, the book on label. Um, I'm being self-promotional. Uh, uh, I will, in, you know, I, I will allow that for a moment. Just let that settle. Okay, I did it. I'm sorry. So being on label, what does that mean? Well, in fashion, right, I remember hooking up with, like, my first big PR agent. And the PR agent was like, Mark, perception is reality. Perception is reality. You have to control. This is all about control the room, 
you need to control the room, right? And what, I, what I've learned is actually, no, you know what? Reality is reality. <laughs> it's not really the same thing. Hello, my brand is white, black, Jewish, Catholic, poor, or rich, smart, numb, talented, or dumb. You see, the world will try to package you and put you on a shelf. So if you're going to be one, brand it for yourself. That's from the trailer. Uh, it's on, you can find that on YouTube from, for the book, but it's a little excerpt. But the spirit of what I was trying to do uh, with the book and, and really kind of the spirit of what it means to be an unlabeled is, you know, to recognize that as a society, you know, we put a certain taxonomy on products. You know, we like to group them and organize them like we do the, shop, the shopping store. It happens to us personally as brands, as, as products ourselves, right? We buy our dairy in the dairy section and, you know, the meat in the meat section and, uh, the condoms in the condom section, because that's the order of how you should be shopping. Um, but we know how, they, there's, a, there's a reason for this. And not that it's all bad, I don't begrudge it, uh, but these frameworks are designed to help us as consumers and from an information management navigate the world, places, people, things, ideas, notions, so we get a sense of where they fit. We need to understand their label, right? But if we're not careful, we find ourselves acting out the label that society has slapped onto our tin can, right? That kind of skin to the world view of our brand, right? And we lose sight of our guts to the skin brand, right, in the process. And we almost play to and we parrot to this perceived version of ourselves. We focus on the flourishes, the outside, attempting to remain in fashion and relevant, right? This is what we do. You change your hair, your clothes, who you roll with, what you're listening to, what you're reading, right? And, and, and there's parts of this that are natural and for sure uh, are hopefully built on the values, guts to the skin. But all too often, if you're not careful, we do it from skin to the world. And we end up dressing the same, making our resumes look the same. Basically, group thinking, you know, like, like a big sheep, a uh, big herd of sheep. And in fashion, what's interesting, because in my industry, coming out of that, right, the, 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 and as like an etymology nerd, like I like to break down the word, it comes from uh, this Latin word, which is a, uh, uh, it's the idea of a group of people acting together, right? And fashion, there's, there's, a, there's a, a logic there. It's a beautiful industry. It's a great medium. I love expressing in it. And I get the zeitgeist. And... And you know, wearing you know, I'm wearing drop crotch pants now and jog jeans. I mean, I, I get it. There's 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 a place for it, but I found in the industry that fas fashion could be uh, unintentionally fascist and assign very harsh control and authority. And isn't it funny that fashion, which should be about art and expression, and even in the arts industry, isn't it funny how we do this to ourselves? There are no rules. Let the rules go, express, but then it ends up being a lot of rules, right? So this was, uh, I'll never forget this date, this little anecdote. Uh, it was October 6, 2008. I won't forget it because it was at uh, the board meeting for the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Uh, I'm an emeritus board member of the CFDA. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's kind of like the Justice League for fashion designers. So I was having this moment, you know, professionally. I was really kind of disconnected from the operational side of the business. I was out there full-time promoting my perceived brand and not really in the nuts and bolts of the business. And there it was, and like the, basically the financial market shit the bed. That was the day that like there was the TARP announcement uh, where, you know, the, the Bush did that first round of financing and did the big bailout, or which led to the bailout. And here I was. Uh, you know, Vera Wang was there, and uh, Steve Kolb, who's the president, Oscar De La Renta, uh, my sorry, but uh, Diane von Furstenberg, and you know, Kenneth Cole, who was sweating. I just remember him sweating, like looking at his stock. It was just, a, it was a mess. But I was there preaching the gospel of streetwear, right? I was on this mission because I realized, like, hey guys, it was the first board meeting that was being held in my office. 
which was kind of like a big you know, deal. Like all these gatekeepers are in my office. This is, a big, this is a big deal. So I make the big ask. I say, hey, you know, I think that the CFDA should offer a new award category. I think it should recognize sport and street. And here was my thesis. I said, when Tinker Hatfield designs a Nike, or let's say a designer at Arc Arcteryx or Burton Snowboards, it's somehow perceived as industrial design, and our ecosystem doesn't necessarily look, look at it in the right manner and give it the respect that's due. But if Marc Jacobs does it for Louis Vuitton, it's fashion. I said, I think we could in broaden our umbrella and invite perhaps this other cohort of street and skate and and uh, uh, active design into uh, our, our tent by having an award that recognizes that cohort. Oh, they loved it. I presented it, and I remember Oscar De La Renta was like, oh, I love this, is such a, this is a brilliant idea, it's refreshing. <laughs> I like Oscar. I didn't mean that in a mean way, but that's, that's how he speaks. <laughs> and uh, they're like, let's have a special committee Let's have a special committee to assess if this could happen. All right, now remember, this was the TARP thing just happened. So what a great opportunity, all these gatekeepers at my door. We're going to have a special committee. I could now shape and ch change their view on this, perhaps get this wouldn't this be a major breakthrough. So I waited, and I waited, <laughs> and I kept waiting, and eventually I could tell uh, um, I, I tell Katie, who's here tonight, I said, Kate, let's call them. And I said, let's find, what happened with the committee, right? Get the call back, speak to, uh, speak to them. And uh, they're like, look, the economy isn't good. We don't think it's time. We don't think that it's necessary inside the CFDA. I think we think that the stack of the awards are good as they are. There's no need for any committee. It's like, ah, oh, damn. Didn't make any sense. It was indecipherable. Right? It was confusing. It's kind of like you know, a blivet, you know, like, like that thing. You know, the, it was an optical illusion. <laughs> it basically, the whole thing was annoying and pointless. <laughs> and I was, found myself in the maze of this blivet, trying to make sense of it. But it wasn't real. Perception, reality, 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 right? What's my point, right? I was so busy trying to round off my edges so busy assigning so much value to this third party power structure, these gatekeepers, they weren't bad people or having ill intentions. It's not their fault that I had this point of view, right? But my divergent ideas, I didn't give myself credit of, of the kind of independence that it had bred for me. I was really looking for their gatekeeper anointing. I was looking for their approval and I was letting myself get frustrated by this. And the point is, in life, in, in business, in your profession, the, whatever those third party existential forces are, we often give so much power to them, right? They gate us, they gate you, right? And when you're gonna ask for change, it's gonna be with friction, you know, it's gonna be work. Perhaps you're gonna ask for enemies. And changing and having to ask to, to to soften your edges or to apologize for your square edges doesn't make any sense. Gatekeepers inadvertently breed groupthink. And that's not to say that there was, like I said, I have no, I don't begrudge the CFDA. They're a great organization. It's, it's been amazing to watch them emerge. They're now finally recognizing Shane from Hood by Air this year uh, as uh, one of the up and coming Perry Ellis Designers of the Year, which is really exciting. It's about time. Um, but I, the point is, is how much energy in my life I gave to those gatekeepers? How much energy you have given? You know who I'm talking about. It might have been your boss. It might have been a, the dean at the school. It might have been whoever. So, no, look, there's certain gating that needs to happen. The law is the law, okay? There's certain gatekeepers, like, don't go out there and shoot somebody or, like, you know, rob someone. That's wrong, right? But don't, like, just settle for the way that the distribution is. Don't just settle because the shelves are stacked a certain way that you have to fit in that way, right? Don't lose sight of the goalkeepers, right? The goalkeepers who care more about 
what you more not only care about what you're making, but they're expecting how you make them feel to be as equally as important, right? If not more so. They're the ones to keep track of the goalkeepers, not the gatekeepers. When you refuse to be labeled, suddenly you play by your own rules, not theirs, right? And when rules start to look like blivets, defy them, challenge them, even if there's going to be friction. Measure yourself up to your own ultimate standards versus gatekeepers, often abstract and irrelevant compliance metrics. All right, come on, SATs, they make you better in life? I'm not, I'm just saying, educational testing service, just saying, there's some compliance standards that are kind of old and not really relevant. <laughs> All right? But we give them so much power. Be conscientious on that. No one should have a monopoly on validation, on label. That's why the formula. As if someone could organize it in some mathematical Ponzi scheme. Come on. You think I was serious with that shit? <laughs> OK, I kind of am. But so is he. Have you ran the numbers on that? E equals mc squared. But for sure, genius isn't necessarily 99 and 1. x plus y is not always z. And ultimately, on the axis of time and action, which is really what your brand is going to be you know, behaving on. It's about your body of work, man, and women, folks. <laughs> it's about your body of work. Your brain, it's differential longitudinal calculus. It's not finite, right? That's the problem. You want it to be done. But as artists, as creators, if you embrace the mess, right? You know, if you unlabel, you know that it's never really finished. It's a work in progress, OK? So embrace the mess, create wealth that matters, quick counting, and be an unlabel. Those are the three hi-hats. Capiche? <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time.